Well, good evening. My name's Denny Smith. Welcome to the show. About a week ago, one of my neighbors, Lori Simmons, sent me an email to tell me about a man she and her husband had met last, I think she said Labor Day weekend. They had gone up to the Shipwreck Museum in Michigan. His name was Dennis Hale, and he was the sole survivor of a shipwreck of the Daniel J. Morrell on Lake Huron back in 1966. I've flown around Lake Huron in the in the gyroplane. It's a huge lake. Uh, there's the there's the Georgian Bay on the north side of it. But over the weekend, they dropped off this book that Dennis Hale has written, and it's a, a it tells the tale of a terrible sequence of events in late November of 1966. I've been pounding my way through that book ever since. On Monday, I dropped a quick email to Dennis Hale, the author and the survivor, invited him to join us this evening, and he graciously he called me back really quick and agreed to share a story with all of you. So without much more delay, let's meet him. Dennis Hale, welcome to the Denny Smith Show here on 93 WIBC. It's good to have you. Well, thank you. I'm very uh, grateful that you called. I, you know, Telling my story is really therapy for me, and I, I won't pass up an opportunity. Well, I'm glad to hear that because it's quite a story. Um, after reading a lot of your story, I want you to know how deeply touched I was by the ordeal that you experienced. Anybody who has ever been at sea knows that your experience one night in November of 1966 is everybody's nightmare when you go to sea. But before we get going here, we need to get to know you just a little bit better. Tell me about where you were living at the time you put out to sea on this last voyage of the Daniel J. Morrell. Uh, I was living in Ashtabula, Ohio. That's about, uh, eight, about eight miles south of, uh, no, about 16 miles south of Lake, Lake Erie and about 15 miles from the Pennsylvania line. How many times had you been to sea before this voyage? This was my third year. The average trip uh, out there was, uh, like I worked for Bethlehem Steel in Lackawanna, New York. And if we were to go up to Duluth, uh, Wisconsin area, that would be three days up and three days back. But then as soon as you unload, you flip and go back. Okay, now were you were you going from um, south to north? Where, what was the direction of the Morel uh, on this cruise? Well, we were going from Lackawanna, which is in the southern part of, you know, Lake Erie. Okay. All the way up to the northern part of uh, Lake Superior. All right. How'd you ever get into the sailor in business anyway? What uh, mm-hmm. what drove you to or got you to the sea? Well, I don't know. It's uh, just something I always wanted to do, and I, I you know, I, I was married in... Um, I guess I had a little bit of wanderlust, and I, I kind of thought this would be my last great adventure. But little did I know that it would be my last great adventure. You were born in 1940, so at the time of this, uh, on this voyage, you were 26 years old. Did I get that right? That's correct, yeah. All right. What was your job on board the ship? Well, that year I had passed a test with the Coast Guard, and I became an able-bodied seaman. I started as an ordinary seaman, and uh, my job was that of a watchman where I was in charge of the deck crew. But, uh, you know, you work four-hour watches, or, or that's what they're called. And you, you work two four-hour watches a day. And mine was from four in the morning till eight in the morning and four in the evening till eight in the evening. So I actually did not have a deck crew. I would stand my watches in the pilot house or on the bow and uh, did ladder watches. Um, what were you looking for, Dan, or Dennis? Anything, uh, any obstructions or boats in the water that we might be able to hit or, or, you know. All right, so you were watching out to sea. You weren't watching yeah. the ship itself. You were watching no. out to sea. No. Uh, binoculars, uh, any sort of uh, sight glasses? No, usually, uh, you know, if we were in the rivers, I, st- I did my watch right on the bow of the ship. Okay. And in the lake, I'd stand it uh, in the pilot house. So four hours on, four hours off? Four hours on, eight hours off. Eight hours off. All right. And what did you do at night? How would you, did you have infrared? What were you, how could you see out to sea? Well, you you just you know, just look out and you look for other lights because all the other ships had lights on them. I see. You know, and uh, range lights, and you look for those lights until until the first mate or the wheelsman you saw these lights out there and where they were. Were you considered part of the merchant marine? You said you worked for Bethlehem Steel. Yeah. Was that? Were you? Did you have merchant marine status? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I did. All right. So, um, twenty six years old. Um, this was you. You had done this for three years. Um, how long was a typical voyage? Uh, six days, you know, three up, three back. All right. And I really enjoyed it. It, uh, you know, the camaraderie the men share. It was, uh, it was something I really wasn't used to because I really never had a family. You know, my mother died when I was born, and I was kind of shifted around. And guys on the boat were were more like brothers than they were, you know, workmates. Your first twenty six years, were you? Uh, 
considered a good kid or a troublemaker? You know, tell me a little oh, no. bit about that. I, I was a bad kid. You were a bad yeah. kid? Oh, yeah, yeah. All right. I, uh, I was kicked out of California when I was 13. You got kicked out of California? Yeah, for incorrigibility, and I had 17 counts of Grand Theft Auto against me. Holy cow. And uh, Oh, yeah. And I was sent back. Uh, I would say that's incorrigible. I'd have thrown you out of California, too. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Like I say, you know, nobody really looked out after me, and uh, it wasn't. I didn't have the best life there was. All right. So where, where did you go after California? I was sent back to Ohio. Ohio. And then did you hook up with your father and your stepmother at that point? Yeah, at that point. And then I was there, I don't know how long, and I, I, I was very unhappy there. I didn't know my father. And so I, I was going to go to Cleveland, and I got to Cleveland. I only had to change in my pocket, you know. But somehow I managed to uh, scrape enough money together to hitchhike all the way back to California. After you'd been thrown out? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so what happened in California after you hit Well, hitchhiked? I was there a day, and I, I went to visit my aunt, and she said I couldn't stay there. And then the following day, I was picked up by the police again. So uh, what happened? Were you arrested, or were you just escorted to the to the state line again? Well, I was arrested, then, you know, put on a bus and uh, sent back to Ohio. I, what I, you know, I, it was a thing where I, that happened three different times. I would get picked up, and, you know, each time was kind of a learning lesson. And the last time I was picked up, I was always a big kid for my age, and I was about 15 the last time. And um, I hitchhiked into Cleveland. I had, I think, like $43 in my pocket that I stashed away from working in a restaurant. And uh, I got a sleeping room next to a bus line, and uh, I get a paper every evening and go, go apply for jobs the next day. And I got hired at an A company warehouse. And so I take a bus to work every day. And uh, go back to my, I had a sleeping room, and go back to the sleeping room and uh, pretty much mind my own business. Joining me this evening is Dennis Hale. Dennis is the sole survivor of a, uh, of a ship called the Daniel J. Morrell, and it was shipwrecked. Dennis went down along with, Dennis, were there 29 other guys or 30 other guys? There was 28. 28 other guys. I was 29. You were number 29. And he has written a book called Shipwrecked. And he, uh, Dennis, I got to tell you, it was forty-five years. It was published in two thousand and ten. Why did you, uh, you know, what was the journey that you were making that it took forty-five years to write this book? Well, um, th- there were a lot of things after the shipwreck that uh, I had a hard time dealing with. As a matter of fact, I I really didn't start dealing with them until I was asked about um, uh, speaking one time in. Uh, it was a hard decision, but I did talk. But right after I talked, I, I felt like a big weight had been lifted off of me, not associating that with the fact that I had I'd just talked about the sinking. And then I uh, always have, have people ask me questions. And uh, no matter what they ask me, I would try and, I would try and answer it. I got and, the feeling from the book that you were brutally honest no matter what. I remember the rage that you you tried to describe uh, during the first inquiry when the Coast Guard came in and asked you some of the stupidest questions, like, where were your papers? Yeah. But I always found that you were brutally honest throughout the book. Have you always been that way? Oh, no, no. I, I've, I You know, for a lot of years, I wasn't a very nice guy. I, uh, I've hurt a lot of people in my lifetime, and uh, uh, I guess the only person I really hurt was myself, though, for the things I had done. Dennis, but, Hale, Dennis Hale is joining me from Ohio this evening. What was the cargo of the Morrell? Big pardon? What was the cargo on the Morel? Well, we were light. We were going up for a load of taconite. These are little round pellets that are consist of uh, coke, clay, and iron ore. And they're, they're, they fire them to, to manufacture steel. Okay. And we were going up for a load of that taconite up to uh, uh, Taconite Harbor, Minnesota. All right. So you you were empty at the time of the of the sinking. That's correct. Wow, I missed that altogether. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, when we come back, uh, Dennis Hale is joining us here, but when we come back, we're going to start this journey uh, f- for the beginning of the last voyage of the Daniel J. Morrell. Dennis Hale joins me. He was the sole survivor. It is one of the most harrowing um, tales of ordeal uh, and survival that you will ever hear. My name is Denny Smith, along with Dennis Hale, right here on 93 WIBC. 93 WIBC. My name's Denny Smith. You know, some of the best books I've ever gotten, I've gotten from people that just said, Denny, you ought to read this book. And that's exactly what Lori Simmons did. She sent me an email. She's just like you. Uh, she listens to the show, and she said, you got to get a hold of this fella. 
And uh, on Sunday, her husband Robert dropped off uh, a book called Shipwrecked that uh, Lori and Robert had gotten from the author, Dennis Hale, back on Labor Day uh, of last year. Um, I was lucky enough to track this fella down. His name is Dennis Hale, and Dennis is joining us again. Dennis, again, thanks for taking time out this evening. I have been so looking forward to hearing your story. Now, you uh, you found yourself on the Daniel J. Morrell. You were heading uh, from south to north up towards what, Sault Ste. Marie? Taconite Harbor, Minnesota. Taconite ha- Harbor, Minnesota. All right. Were you? Did you guys always sail the Great Lakes? Did you ever go out on the open ocean? No, it was always the Great Lakes. These bo- boats aren't built for that. They they're flat bottom boats. Okay. No keel. And how old was how old was the SS uh, Daniel J. Morrell? Tell me about the boat itself. Well, it was built in 1906. It was 60 years old, which was the average age of most of the boats that were out there then. And. Um, she was of steel construction, six hundred and six foot long by by seventy five feet. Six hundred and six. That's uh, that's two hundred yards. Yeah, that's a lot of ship. Yeah. Um, all right. So, uh, how was it powered? Was it coal fired or was it diesel fired? No, it was coal fired. Coal fired. Yeah. All right. Um, how long had you been on? Had you been on that that ship before? Or was this your first time on this ship? Well, that was my third season. That was your third season yeah. on the Morel. That's right. All right. So you you knew your way around. Well, yeah, I was I I was comfortable with it. Had I, you? Uh, I enjoyed it very much. Um, the, uh, the A day for you was four hours on, eight hours off. So that's 12 hours. So you had two four-hour shifts and a yeah. 24-hour day. Yeah. When did you get your meals? Uh, whenever I could, basically. In the morning, uh, after I get off at 8 o'clock. And in the evening, uh, at 6 o'clock, I would relieve the wheelsman in the pilot house. All right. So you were at the bow of the ship. Yeah. All mm-hmm. right. Yeah, there's a separation of it. The engine crew stays in the back, and the deck crew stays in the forward end. Did you know many of the guys on the on the engine crew? Oh yeah, a lot of the guys I sailed with uh, uh, for not for three years, really. All right. How did you get hired on? Uh, Twenty six years old, basically uh, a, a troublemaker, a troubled youth. Got you know <laughs> trouble followed you everywhere you went. How'd you end up uh, as a seaman? Well, I, I was married, and I had two stepchildren and two of my own children. And in 1966, jobs were pretty scarce. So I decided, uh, you know, I had this fascination with the Great Lakes, and I figured, well, I'm going to go sailing. So um, I went to the Coast Guard Station, 9th District Coast Guard Station in Cleveland, and uh, told them what I wanted to do. And my first requirement was to get a letter from a a steam check company saying that they would provide me with a job. And uh, so I went to Bethlehem Steel in the Terminal Tower building in Cleveland, and they gave me a letter. And uh, I took it back to the Coast Guard, and they processed me. And um, that was in the in the late summer, and then early sp- next spring, I I received the instructions to go to Erie, Pennsylvania, to board Daniel J. Morrell that had been in mothballs for like four years. What type of training uh, do you get uh, to go into the Merchant Marine? I mean, do you go to school? Do you you know what do they? Where do you learn in order to be considered a seaman? Well, nowadays, yeah. Back then, you just had to be able to climb a ladder. <laughs> basically, you know. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. And All then right. you learn from the other guys. And there's, they give you a booklet that tells you how to advance yourself. And uh, uh, if I would have applied myself and stayed on the boat, I could, have been, I could have become a captain. Really? Yeah. So the first rank was seaman, then able-bodied seaman? Yeah. And what happens after that? I mean, where do you go after well, that? Well, from there, you, able-bodied, you can be a wheelsman, uh, you can be a watchman, um, and just, uh, you know, continue up the ladder. You have to learn all the buoys on the Great Lakes and uh, all the uh, channels you navigate and everything else. And there are certain time, places you you have a steering pole that sticks out in the front of the ship. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you, put that pole on this building over there and you swing it around where you can put that pole on it. And, you know, that's that's how they navigate. Interesting. Dennis yeah. Hale joins us uh, this evening. He was the sole survivor of a shipwreck of the Daniel J. Morrell back in 1966. We're about to hear... Uh-huh. The story of that fateful night, um, it was on the day of November 28, 1966. Now, at that point, um, had you just finished a watch, or um, what, tell me what was going on the day before the shipwreck. Where were you, and what were you doing? Well, I have to extend that a little bit. I had missed the ship in Buffalo. Um, when we, we were downbound from Taconite Harbor on our last run for the season. Okay. And we were supposed to go in, tie it up, lay the ship up, and go home. And we were about a day out of Lackawanna, New York, when we received word that we had to make one more run, another ship to Lackawanna, where the Lehigh had broken down and had to go into Erie for boiler problems. 
So needless to say, the crew was pretty well bummed out because they were planning on going home. Now, was this would this have been uh, an extra run? Would it have been an overtime run, or would it just, no, just another run? No, overtime. You get straight wages. It's just an uh, tack on, basically. All right. But uh, when we got to Lackawanna, there were two boats ahead of us, and it takes about eight hours uh, to unload the boat. And I figured, well, you know, I got pretty close to 24 hours. I, I'm going to talk to Maid and see if I can go home. Because going into Buffalo all the time, I did keep a car there. And I checked with him, and he said, sure. So another fellow went with me, and I dropped him off in Erie and went home and uh, called him before I, I left home to go back to the boat and uh, had a friend with me and to drive my car back because I didn't know where we were going to lay up okay. at the end of the season. And when we got to Buffalo, I could see from the lights, uh, uh, the, we had missed a morale. She, her lights were just clearing the brake wall. Oh, no. And so I went to the Coast Guard station and called the captain on the ship to shore. And he said to meet it at Mullins Fuel Lock in Ontario, right across from Detroit. Had I missed that boat and, and couldn't get back aboard, I'd lost something like $7,000 in bonuses. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So now I'm trying to think where you were. Detroit, did you go across the Blue Water Bridge? Then did you scoot around and then cross over to on the Ontario side? Yes. Okay. Yeah, basically. We, we went back to my place, spent the night. And then left the next morning. And, and when we got there, the morale was still at anchor in the river because of uh, high winds. So we just hung around the, the dock basically for almost 24 hours. It was 8 o'clock the next morning before the morale came in. On the phone with me is Dennis Hale. He is the sole survivor of a shipwreck we are going to learn about this evening. Um, you worked pretty hard to get on a boat that was going to sink, son. Yeah, yeah, I sure did. Yeah, there, you, there was a message there for me. I didn't see it. Though. You didn't see it. Yeah. Uh, what type of ship did you run on board um, when you got there? We, um, did you did you hit the Did you get on board on the twenty eighth, the day before the wreck? Yes, I got on. I got on that morning, and uh, we had gone to anchor again after I had got, after I had climbed aboard. And anyhow, when I got on board, they told me to go to bed. My watch was almost over, which I did. Now, did they yell at you? Um, I took a razzing, I guess you would say. Okay. Nobody yelled at me. I just I just took a razzing from everybody for missing the boat again. Okay. <laughs> again? Yeah. I oh, you've done that once before? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm pretty Dennis. good at that. <laughs> oh, man. All right, so you went to bed. Yeah. All right, so now this is on the night of the 28th. Uh-huh. You were in bed. Yeah. All right, now. This was the morning of the 28th. Then I got up and I stood my, my watch that evening, and um, I was awake at about 3 o'clock, just down my 4 o'clock in the evening watch. And All right. I went back to the galley, grabbed a bite to eat, and took a little bit of razzing from some of the crew. Good. And then about 10 minutes to 4, I went up to the pilot house and uh, took a little bit of razzing from the first mate, my boss, and the wheelsman. Well, tell me about the the weather conditions. You, you're watching this. You're inside behind glass, yeah. but did you notice any weather conditions that um, concerned you? You know, they had the Weather Channel on constantly, and, you know, you're having conversation and listening to the Weather Channel, and there was nothing, uh, uh, nothing came across the, the radio. At 6 o'clock, the wheelman, wheelman went back to eat, and I, I relieved him at the wheel. And, um, so you were actually doing this, you were steering the ship? Well, we were on what they called Iron Mike, like power steering. Oh, okay. And uh, all I had to do was make sure she stayed on course. And um, Are you telling me it was idiot-proof? Yeah, well, I okay. think so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I, I've, ne- I've never been at sea on this. I mean, I've been on yeah. a little catch rig, but I've never uh, been well, they, on, on a big ship. They didn't have that termination back then, but yeah, okay. you're basically right. All right. Um, he came back probably, uh, I, I relieved him at six, and he came back close to seven. And then I went back to grab a bite to eat, and uh, I probably, uh, you know, I talked to some of the guys. I checked. I had one guy that worked for me, a deck watch. And his job was sounding the ballast tanks on both sides of the ship. And now, what, now what does that mean, sounding a ballast tank? Well, you you put uh, water in these tanks to, to hold the boat down into the water, into the lake. Okay. You know, so it's just not floating right on top of the water. And he had to check those because sometimes water leaked in and sometimes water leaked out. As a matter of fact, uh, when I came on watch, uh, we had to go down into the cargo hold. The ULIC buckets, the, the unloaders, had hit these tanks and um, put holes in them. So we had to go down there with wooden wedges <clears throat> and pound these wedges into these these cracks in the in the steel so that the water wouldn't leak out. Now, the, okay. Now, now what this happens is, is this, that, this that is water an, causes this, is, this wood to swell. Okay, now this is an internal tank within yeah. the hull of the ship. It's, it's called a double bottom. Okay, I got it. Yeah. I got it. Uh, so we had to do that. But... Um, um, 
by the time my watch was over uh, at 8 o'clock, well, wh- when I went back for lunch, there was some spray coming over the bow. Nothing that was uncommon. Now, this is 8 a.m. in the morning. No, no, no. This is, this 8, p- is 8 p.m. 8 p.m., okay. When you said lunch, you threw me. Yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> but, um, uh, All right, so you noticed some spray coming over the bow. Yeah, as I walked down. I walked down the leeward side. All right. You have a windward side where the wind hits it, and the other side is the leeward side. So I walked down the leeward side to keep from getting wet. And um, I was probably back in the in the stern of the ship almost 8, 8.30, quarter, 9, before I came forward, and I dropped a, a meal off for the first mate. And, um, oh, wait, that was my lunchtime, yeah. And uh, I got back about close to 8 o'clock. And after that, the mate asked me to go pick him up something to eat, as did the wheelsman. And I went back, again, going down the leeward side, and I got back up forward probably about, uh, probably around a quarter to nine, and dropped a, dropped a meal off for the first mate, and talked to the watchman for a few minutes, uh, Stu Campbell. He said, oh, Dennis, he said, this is going to be an easy trip. Uh, right up to Taconite Harbor, load up, turn around, come home, layer up and go home. I said, yeah, but, you know, you can never tell about November. He says, no bad reports coming over. He says, this would be an easy trip. And I said, well, okay, you know. So we talked a little longer, and his uh, uh, room was on the spar deck, as was mine. The spar deck is the main deck, the working deck. All right. And mine was uh, closer to the front of the ship than his was. Well, I went to my room. I stripped down to my undershorts, uh, grabbed a book, uh, jumped in bed, turned on my bunk light, and I probably read till probably you know, maybe ten, ten thirty. All right. Now I want you to hold it right there. This is pretty important. You strip down to your boxer shorts. Did you have socks on, Dennis? No, I didn't. You didn't. Okay, so you're just in your in your boxer shorts. Did you have a t-shirt or anything on? No, just my shorts. Just your shorts. All right. You sleep like most men then. Yeah. When we come back, we're going to talk about what happens next. My name's Denny Smith, along with Dennis Hale, who is the sole survivor of the shipwreck. Of the Daniel, the Daniel J. Morrell. We are about to begin this harrowing journey of one brave man. My name is Denny Smith, along with Dennis Hale, right here on 93 WIBC. Good evening. My name is Denny Smith. Welcome to the show. Uh, this evening, I have a very special man. A ship went down on Lake Huron back in 1966. There were 29 men on board, and only one man survived. He is joining us on the phone this evening. His name's Dennis Hale. Dennis, again, thank you for your time this evening. This is a, this is quite a tale, and it it will help people uh, understand quite a journey that you made in life. Yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure for me to be talking to you. All right, now you went to bed at 10 o'clock approximately on November 28th. Is that correct? That's right. All right, now, when did you hear the, the siren or the horn for general quarters um, what happened next? You were in your undershorts. Well, I was in bed reading probably till ten, ten thirty, and uh, I laid the book on the deck of the uh, ship the, on the floor. Okay. And turned out my bunk light and went to sleep. Sometime later that no- night, I heard a loud bang, and in my slumber, I just assumed maybe it was the anchor bouncing on the bow. You know. Was that common? Yes, that was common. Okay. Uh, in, in, in heavy seas, yeah. So I rolled over uh, onto my right side, facing one of the bulkheads, one of the walls. And then there was another loud bang, and this time all the books came off my bookcase. That was Something no that anchor. never happened, you know. Yeah. I figured, well, if it's going to get that bad, I better, I better get up. Uh, I reached overhead, turned on my bunk light, and it wouldn't come on. And um, I think right then and there I knew something was, something was wrong somewhere. Uh, I pulled the curtains from around my bunk, and as I did that, the general alarm sounded. And from where I was on the bottom bunk, I could look up and uh, straight ahead and... Uh, I could see sparks being generated where the hammer was hitting the bell. Well, needless to say, I jumped right out of bed. Now, you're on the spar deck. You're on the main deck. Yeah, I was on the main deck. All right. in next, next to the windlass room. All right. Um, I jumped out of bed. I reached overhead, found a life jacket, and put on. Opened the, the door to the companionway that led to the main deck. All right. Now, wait a minute. You have a life jacket and boxer shorts on at this point. Yes. Do you have anything on your feet? No. Nothing. All right. So where, where were you to report when you heard general quarters? Well, I was just going out on deck. There's no nothing saying where are you to report. Okay. You know? um, uh, I knew where the life raft was if I needed it, but I wanted to see what was going on. Okay. So I ran down the companionway, and as I was, as I got about halfway down the c- uh, companionway, another fellow, Al Wemmy, came out of his room, 
and he was in front of me, and he got to the uh, hatch that led to the main deck, and he uh, he put his hands on the hatch and looked out, and he said, oh, my God. And I said, what, what is it, Al? What's going on? He said, oh, my God. I said, what's going on, Al? And he said, oh, my God, and rushed back to his room. I stepped out onto the main main deck, and as I looked towards the stern of the ship, uh, there was no stern. Um, the ship was buckled or hogged. What does that mean? Did it buckle up in the middle or buckle down in the middle? Well, it kind of bounces, but when I looked back there, it was down. I couldn't see the end, back of it. I could see lights coming up where the deck ended. Oh, my gosh. From the smokestack. But, uh, you know, I knew we had, we had broken. Now, um, you, you later found out that the captain had to do some pretty fancy wiring to even make the alarm sound. What, yeah. had, what had he done to make the alarm sound? He took the battery out of the directional finder and uh, hooked it up to the general alarm system so that it would sound. Now, you know... Uh, that first noise I heard was actually the bottom of the ship exploding, and the second was the starboard side letting go. Um, with that first explosion, uh, it severed the uh, electrical ca- cables coming forward. So, so that's no why you didn't have lights. We didn't have any electricity forward at all. All right, now you're still standing there in your boxers and yeah. your and your life jacket. Did you go ahead and fasten the life the life jacket, or did, was it just hanging loosely around your shoulders at um, that point? I think I, I I don't think I fastened it. I walked over to the port side to the crew's work hall. Barefoot. Yeah. That's well, you know. There's a covering overhead, uh, All right. the tarp, and uh, I walked over the cruise hall, work hall, and there were three fellows in there already. Uh, Norm Bragg, he uh, survived the sinking, of the sinking of the Steinburner in 1958, I believe it was, and uh, two of the deckhands were in there. And John Grove, the fellow I drove to Erie, was in there as well. So I mean, there was there was only four of us there. Did they know what was going on? Yeah, you know, I kind of looked to Norm Bragg. <laughs> Uh, for kind of, kind of like guidance because, you know, he had been in the sinking, you know. And uh, we talked about what was going on and what was happening and what to expect. And then he said, well, fellas, he said, we better go back and get on the raft. It's been good to know you. Just now, like that? Huh? It's been good to know you? Yeah. Isn't that what Gordon Lightfoot said uh, when he sang yeah. the song about the Edmund Fitzgerald? Yes, it is. Oh, my gosh. But, uh, so, all right, now, you... you uh, <laughs> You're in your BVD, son, and you've got a, a life jacket. Did yeah. you decide to go back to your room at that point? What did you decide to do? I decided uh, I needed more clothing on. Um, so I walked back to the companionway and stepped inside, and it was like being in a cave. It was just totally black. Oh, you had no light? No light at all, nothing, nothing, not even a hair of a light, you know. And my room was a third one back on the right side, so I, I put out my right hand, and started walking uh, cautiously towards the bow, of the, towards the front of the ship. Again, barefoot. Yeah, counting the doorways as I uh, as I went back. Uh, when I got to my room, it was even darker. I stepped inside and I searched around for more clothing. And uh, not knowing how much time I had, uh, I did find a, a navy wool pea coat, and I put that on and went back out onto the companionway and out onto the main deck, and started walking back uh, towards the life raft. The life raft was probably, oh, geez, I, you know, I have no way of really knowing, probably. I'm going to let you think for just a second, because I want to get people back to who you are and what's going on. Dennis Hale is on the phone with us right now, and he is in the midst of describing the sinking of the Daniel J. Morrell back in November. This was the morning of November 29th, 1966. Dennis was one of 29 crew members. He was the only one to survive, and you are hearing his recollection of his encounters with all of the shipmates, those that did not make it, as he makes his way back to his room. He's in his uh, BBDs. Are you a brief guy or a boxer guy? I was a brief guy then. You're a brief guy there. Okay, so you got your briefs on, and you got... Um, you, you have your uh, life jacket, and you go back and you find a Navy pea coat. I put that on over the life jacket. All right. Uh, as I'm walking back, oh, it's probably probably 60 feet back to the to the life raft. It's on the main spar deck. Uh, as I'm walking back, I can feel ice and slush coming up between my toes. So it, you it, still didn't put on any shoes or anything. I didn't have time to look for them. Oh, you know, at a time like that, you got to grab what you can get. That's and right. Go with it, you know. But I could feel this ice and slush coming up between my toes, so I figured it must have snowed or iced or something. Could you feel the ship pitching in any way, Dennis? Not at that point, no. All right. What did you hear? Um, well, once I got to the raft, I, I, I crawled on the raft uh, behind John Grove, the drive, a guy I took to, to Erie, PA, and he had a rope, and he was lashing himself down to the raft. Uh, 
I didn't have any rope, and I I really didn't want to lash myself down to it in case I had to move real quick, you know, and get out of the way for some reason. Did you guys ever have any training on on lifeboat drills or life raft yeah, drills? Yeah, lifeboat drills. But did they tell you to, li- to lash down, or was that just uh, well, John? Ta- you're talking lifeboat. I'm talking life raft. Life raft. Okay, but did John feel that uh, lashing himself down was the only smart thing to do at that point? Well, yeah, obviously, uh, Norm yeah. Bragg, uh, the fellow that was on the Steinburner when it sunk, he also was lashing himself down. Oh my I guess the idea was not to get separated from the raft. Okay. But uh, as I sat on the raft, uh, well, let me let me let me put you in the right mood. That night, uh, we had sixty sixty five mile an hour winds. Oh my gosh! Thirty thirty five foot. Now, seat. were you windward or leeward at this point? Where where was the life raft on the deck? In the center of the in in the center of the. Uh, between the port side and the starboard side. So in front of the wheelhouse? Behind it. Behind the wheelhouse. Well, you were still taking full force wind then. Oh, yeah. We were right out, right out in the open. Oh, my gosh. So we had, you know, uh, 65 mile an hour winds, 35 foot seas, uh, and you're water in your... temperature of 44, and an air temperature of 33. And you're in your BVDs. Yeah. And, and, and uh, barefoot. Yeah. But while everybody was coming to the raft or getting getting around the raft, uh, you know, there's a, a 32-man crew was a usual compliment, but we were short three people. I know I was short one guy in my room. But um, everybody was coming around, getting around the raft. There was conversation between the first mate and the captain about uh, no SOS was given. It had broken too fast, and they just didn't have time to get off an SOS. So nobody knew you were in trouble? No. And we were told that as soon as we got into the into the water... Uh, to make and onto a rag back onto the raft to make sure that we fired off flares because the sister ship the EY Townsend was within, was within 15 miles of us. All right, now I want you to hold that thought, Dennis. Right. Dennis Hale is joining me. He is the sole survivor. 29 men boarded the Daniel J. Morrell, and only one survived, and he is joining us on the phone here this evening. When we come back, we're going to find out what happens to this life raft right here on 93 WIBC. Thank you, John. I will tell you folks that I have heard a lot of stories in my life. This one is probably one of the most harrowing I've ever heard. Joining us this evening, Dennis Hale, the sole survivor of a ship that was wrecked in Lake Huron back in 1966. It was the latter days of November 1966. It was a Daniel J. Morrell. He tried to miss the ship twice and uh, ended up on the ship uh, for one last trip up for... uh, for cargo, and all of a sudden he gets up in the middle of the night, and he hears the general alarm. He comes out in his BVDs, barefoot, and a life jacket, and he notices that the bow of the ship has been separated from the stern of the ship. It has buckled. Now, Dennis, I I guess the the first thing I need to ask you is, what did you hear during all this uh, this time? You said that it was a very short period of time, from the time you heard the alarm to the time that you were in the life raft and things were going down. How many minutes was that? Well, from the time the general alarm sounded until I wound up in the water, it was eight minutes. Oh, ended up in the water, so you didn't yeah. make it to the to the life raft? I was on the raft, but, you know, the, the noise, you, you mentioned the noise. Uh, let me set you up here. I was sitting on the raft facing the port side, which means to my right was the front of the ship, the bow, right, and to my left was the stern of the ship. And I'm you were taking these, you were taking the wind right in your full face. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. But I could I could hear, you know, the laboring of the engine, uh steam escaping, the wind whispering through the wi- whistling through the wires and the crunching of metal. And you know, that there's conversation going on about uh once we get into the water to uh, fire off some flares, there's other ships in the area and I missed a lot of con- conversation because of all the crazy things going on. How could me. you hear? You had 65 mile an hour wind. If you had a ship buckling, did you hear tearing steel? Yes. Uh, ex- describe to people what a tearing steel sounds like. A lot of people have never heard the term tearing steel. It's, Tell it's them what. It's just a, a, re- a real deep wrenching uh, grind is what it's like. And uh, did you have to worry it, about? Did you have to worry about exploding rivets? Yeah. Oh yeah. But, oh my! But as I sat there, um, something caught my eye, my eye on the on the bow of the ship, and I looked on the bow up on the second deck, the forecastle deck. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the uh, mates was up there with a flashlight. The second mate fumbling around by his room, and I kept thinking, you know, get down here with us, you know, safety in numbers, you know. Do you remember that that crewman's name? Um, yeah. <laughs> That's all right. We'll. I, I won't yeah. put you through that. Yeah. Now you'd been through life raft drills before. No, you had life, not. Life, life raft. 
and the lifeboat, not life raft. Life raft drill. Okay. But this raft was designed to stay on the on the boat as it sank, and then to float away. And uh, there was a carbide light attached to it that, when it got wet, it would it would ignite. But you know, as I as I sat on this raft, I heard another noise towards the stern of the ship, towards the back. Now they still had lights back there. And I looked, and standing in front of the after cabins was a guy named Dan Don Worcester, a real big guy, not heavy, big. And he was from from Maine, and he was an oiler, and he was standing in front of those cabins, looking forward with an oil can in his hand. And I'm wondering, they couldn't have got a, a general alarm back there. The only way they knew something was wrong is because they were losing steam and and the noise and everything. And then as I'm watching him, I I, I something caught my eye, and I looked over my left shoulder towards the starboard side. And the main deck was starting to tear. It tore real slow, like a piece of paper. Oh boy! And you could see sparks coming from it. And every every once in a while, there was like a a puff of smoke. I think it was uh, when it would hit a rivet, and the rivet would go flying, and that, that rust and dust would come out of it. I watched it tear all the way up to the hatch combings, to the hatches, and then as it went between the hatches, you could hear it tear. And when it got to the port side, I watched it tear all the uh, all the way across. And then the two sections separated, and somehow the stern uh, became abreast of the bow, so that now if I looked over the port side, I was looking into the cargo hold of the stern of the ship. Oh, my gosh. And it was advancing towards us. If I looked over my left shoulder, I was looking into Lake Huron. Oh, my gosh. Well, the stern got quite close, and I, 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 I got scared, and I closed my eyes, and I held on to the steel pipe I was sitting on. And uh, I was thinking the bow section was going to come right over there. I mean, the stern section was going to come right over the Because it was still under full power. Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, next thing I knew, I was in the water. All right, we're going to stop it right there, and we're going to go into our news break. But that was the next thing that you knew. There were two life rafts. You were on the forward one. And uh, joining me, Dennis Hale, uh, the only survivor of the shipwreck of the Daniel J. Morrell. Folks, I'm telling you, the story just gets tougher from here. We have told you that he's in his BVDs. He has a life uh, a life vest on, and he has a pea coat over the top of that. He is barefoot, 65-mile-an-hour winds, and it's about 35 degrees. When we come back, the rest of the story of the Daniel J. Morrell and Dennis Hale right here on 93 WIBC. My name's Denny Smith. Welcome to the show. Uh, this evening, we have a sole survivor of a terrible shipwreck that took place in the latter part of November in 1966. Folks, that was nearly 45 years ago. Two years ago, uh, Dennis Hale decided to write the story, and he joins us here this evening. Dennis, again, thank you for taking time out to to share this story. Oh, that's fine. You were, uh, the last thing you remember after uh, after uh, boarding the raft is you ended up in the water. Tell me what happened uh, from that point on. You were in the water. Uh, again, you're in your BBDs, You've got your life uh, vest on, and you've got a pea coat uh, over the top of that. Yeah. What what happened when you came to? Well, uh, I wasn't out. I was just thrown overboard, and uh, I don't know how deep I went in the water, but I didn't know which way was up. Uh, forgetting I had a life jacket on, I, started, I let some air bubbles out and followed them to the surface. And once I got to the surface, um, I could see nothing. There was no nothing around me. Um, you couldn't see the bow anymore? You couldn't see the stern anymore? Not from the vantage point I was at, no. Wow. I was looking for the life raft, and uh, but my whole body just kind of contracted when I hit that water, and it was it was kind of hard to get moving again. I have been in 40-degree water, yeah. and we were doing a, a dead man, what they call a dead man drill, or man overboard drill, out yeah. in Penobscot Bay in Maine, and the water was so cold that it, it, all of my muscles just froze. I'm assuming that that's what you were experiencing at the time? Oh, yeah, yeah. And huh? I just didn't know, you know. So how did you gain perspective of where the life raft well, was? Well, you know, I point? looked around. I couldn't see the life raft, and then uh, all of a sudden I saw it. Uh, I saw the carbide light, and it was uh, between waves, in the, in the low section of the wave, the trough. Do you have any idea how high the waves were? Could you estimate what those were? At that point, uh, they may have been five-footers. Boy. And... Uh, so I started swimming towards it when I first saw it. No one was aboard. And, you know, swimming with a pea coat on, that was like pulling a bus behind me. Boy. But they tell me, you know, life jacket, I mean, a pea coat, whether it's wet or dry, is good insulation. You know what? Let's tell people what a pea coat is. It is, uh, it's a heavy wool. Um, Navy and, jacket. A Navy jacket. Yeah. And uh, it, it, was it double-breasted or was it single-breasted? Um, I 
think it was single breasted. Yeah. But at any rate, I couldn't I couldn't button it because I had the life jacket under it. So were you mostly kicking for propulsion, or were you getting your arms moving? Oh, to... I, had, I had everything going. I figured all of it was going to be good for me. Boy. Uh, when I got to the raft, uh, you know, when I first saw it, nobody was on it. And then uh, by the time I got there, two men had, had climbed aboard John Cleary and Arch Stojak, and they helped pull me aboard. What happened to the two guys that had strapped themselves in? Mm, they were gone. Oh, my gosh. You know, part of the, part of the side of the raft was missing. There were there were three other guys on your life raft, life raft when everybody got on board. There was Art Stovak, John Cleary, and then Fuzzy uh, yeah. Charles, Charles Fuzzy Fossbender. Fossbender. Okay, I can't remember his last yeah, name. You uh, called him. You Fuzzy. know, I told the guys. I said we have to get into this compartment in the center. I, I have to fire off flares. Um, the one guy, Art Stojak, he was um, he was pretty well in shock. He wasn't making a lot of sense, and he did a lot of whining. And how were they dressed? Uh, Art Stojak just had pajamas on. Uh, John Cleary had. Uh, a sweatshirt and uh, jeans on, and then we helped boost uh, Fuzzy aboard. And Fuzzy was standing watch; he was fully dressed. All right. Uh, uh, basically, cotton type uh, clothes, or were they in woolens? Uh, cotton type. Cotton. Yeah. Um, you know, you there know, wasn't a lot of conversation. I was the only one really talking. Yeah. And, uh, what time was all? Do you know? Do you have a time about when you hit the water? About two o'clock in the morning. Two a.m. Yeah. All right. Well, that's important because that's we're going to try and start this clock here and see how long it took. When the bow went down, you, you describe a situation where time sort of stops and, and you awaken, so to speak, and you're in this water. Uh, when you came up, what fires the carbide lamp? I couldn't get that in my mind. How did the, did, was there a switch? How does carbide fire? When it gets wet, it, light, it ignites. Oh, I got it. Okay. Yeah. And it burns white hot. All right. Um, but on the raft, when all four of us were on there, we tried to get the compartment open. Uh, it, had been, it had been damaged when the raft was thrown overboard. It's a, a very heavy raft. It has two, two metal drums on it filled with some, something buoyant on a metal superstructure in the raft itself are just two-by-fours attached to a framing with a two-by-four on its side for edging. So what's the flotation? Are they barrels? Yeah. All right. Yeah. And the raft itself was probably uh, five foot by eight foot. Uh, it was a 20, 21-man raft, but that was with people in the water holding onto a rope along the side. Um, when, when we did get this compartment open, I, uh, I grabbed a flare gun and I fired off a parachute flare. Uh, kind of disappointed because it only seemed to go up maybe 30 feet, and then the wind took it. So I fired a second one, and the uh, same thing happened. Um, then I closed closed that hatch up. Well, I, I got a, a handheld flare out of there, and uh, I closed that hatch up, and we all kind of laid down and huddled around this flare because I thought it was good for some heat, but uh, it doesn't get off and give off any heat. Uh, I can remember I was I was laying on my right side, and I had this flare over my left leg, and uh, I can remember Charlie Farspender saying, "Don't uh, don't hold that over your leg. That stuff trips on you, because there is uh, a substance that trips off of it. He said that'll burn a hole right through you." All right. Like I really cared at that point because I could hardly feel my legs by then. Now, how far uh, the deck of the life raft? How how far above the water level was that deck? Probably a foot. Just a foot. A foot, maybe maybe eighteen inches. All right. Yeah. Now this was early morning on November twenty ninth, yeah. nineteen sixty six. What were the sea conditions at, on the raft at that point? Well, at that point, right then, uh, it was calm. But uh, with the guys laying around after I after I fired off, oh, after I lit that handheld flare, once it burned out, I got back up on my knees, opened that hatch compartment. And was looking for anything I could find. I got all the parachute flares out and laid them down where I was going to lay down. I got the handheld flares and put them down. And uh, as I was swimming towards the raft, I thought there's a substance called uh, storm oil, which goes into a thing called a sea anchor. And the idea is to to put this canister in the in the sea anchor, and on the end there's a little screw you open up, and it releases oil into the water. And helps keep the the water calm around the raft, but it was of no use, you know, in conditions like that. But I thought about taking that and rubbing it all over my body uh, to try and hold the heat in. Oh, what a great idea! Yeah, well, somebody threw it overboard before I had a chance. Oh man! Along with the sea anchor, Dennis Hale joins me. Uh, he is telling the story of the sinking of the Daniel J. Morrell. Dennis was the only one who survived that terrible day. Uh, on board ship or on board the life raft with him right now are three of his shipmates, Art Stovak, John Cleary, and Fuzzy Fosbender, Charles Fuzzy Fosbender. All right, so uh, I tell you what. Now, Dennis, you guys are in a bad way. Oh, yeah. yeah well, it's get wor- it gets worse. All right. 
once I got everything out of this compartment that I thought I could use, I, I reached up. Uh, this is just a lid on the deck. And I reached up to, to close this lid, and something kind of glittered. And I, I looked up, and what I was looking at was uh, probably a 30, 35 foot wave that oh was towering my. over us. Oh, my Lord. And the only way I saw that is uh, the carbide light was illuminating the foam that was being blown off the top. Uh, it scared the heck out of me. Real quick, I closed that hatch and leaned forward and rolled over t- on my left side, anticipating this wave to crash down on us. Did it? No. Um, it, w- it would have probably been easier if it had. We went through the wave. We went through those waves. Oh, you cut right through it. Yeah. And I don't know what the root dimension is on a, on a wave that size, but I know with that first wave I had time to, to, had to breathe. But when I got in that wave, you're underwater so long, I know that there were spots on, on my lungs I could feel that were, felt like they were starting to burn. And that burning would spread. And then we well, that would be several seconds, maybe, what, 10, 15 seconds, 20 Probably. seconds? Oh, my God. And then you'd break through the backside of that wave, and that 65-mile-an-hour wind would hit you at 34 degrees. And with me, the way I was dressed, it felt like my skin was being pulled off. Again, you're in your BVDs. Yeah. Uh, well, in your jockey shorts, you've got uh, a May West on underneath your pea coat, yep. and that's it. And you're still barefoot. Still barefoot. Oh my gosh! Well, so how many? How many? Was that the only wave that hit you, or were there oh, more? No, no. But after that wave, that carbide light went out, and uh, you couldn't see them coming then. And sometimes you go through those waves with, without the benefit of, the, of a breath of air. And once we'd break through the backside, the first thing you hear was everybody gasping for air and then screaming out in pain as this wind would hit you. All right. Now, Art Stovak was in his pajamas. Yeah. How, did he, how was he handling this? Was he, uh, well, he you... was basically in, in shock, I believe. Okay. And like I said, there, there was no conversation. I, I talked to John Cleary. He was laying in front of me. And I tried to get him to roll over onto his side and curl up in a ball and expose as little of his body as he could because he was laying face down with his fist up by his face. Oh, my. And uh, he told me, he says, if I don't make it, he said, uh, tell Kathy I love her and I'm sorry. Oh, my gosh. And uh, I said, we'll be all right. We're going to make it. And um, that's course. about the only conversation we really had then, but we were going through these heavy seas. And, you know, when you're in a situation like that, you go through what's called a loss of faith syndrome, where you either want to uh, die right now or you want to be picked up right now. But it has to be right now. I know after several of those waves, uh, you know, I was hanging on to a steel bar to keep them getting washed overboard. And after several waves, I would let go of that bar. And that wave would lift me up off the raft. But with the way the guys were placed around me, I couldn't get washed overboard. Our, our, uh, Charlie Farshbender was behind my knees. Art Stojak was behind my back, and uh, John Cleary was uh, laying right in front of me. On the phone with me is Dennis Hale. When we come back, we're going to hear about Dennis's conversation with God. You can only imagine this situation. You're freezing cold. Um, You were on a life raft with no light. Waves are hitting you again and again and again. And uh, there are 65-mile-an-hour winds to contend with. 29 men went into the water, and one man survived, and you are hearing his story tonight right here on 93 WIBC. Many times I get emails from listeners, and I got an email over the weekend from somebody who lives up not too far from me, Lori Simmons. She and her husband, Robert, had been to the Shipwreck Museum in Michigan, and she was telling me about a book that she had uh, had purchased, and we're going to tell you how to find this book because you're going to have to read this book, but... She and her husband, Robert, uh, met the author, Dennis Hale, who is joining us here this evening on the on the phone. He was the sole survivor of the shipwreck of the Daniel J. Morrell on Lake Huron back in November of 1966. Twenty-nine men uh, were on board. Only one survived, and we are learning the story of this uh, harrowing adventure right now. Um, Dennis, at, at one point uh, in the story, as I was reading, you had this very volatile relationship with God, and, and I, I mean no judgment whatsoever, but I would like you to share with us this sheer submission point and then at times volatile anger that you and um, you had with God. Can you sort of take me through that? Well, you know, um, I prayed an awful lot. I prayed. I did a lifetime of praying, and um, 
I prayed for my shipmates and I prayed for their families. Uh, for all I know, the other guys that were not on the raft had been picked up or survived or something. And but I still prayed for everybody. And uh, I was there that night, and then all of the next day, and the following night. And um, the you last went, day I went, was out there, um, you went through two sunrises with God. That's right. Yeah, yeah and talked to him. But that last day. Um, you know, I was 26. I, I never had to deal with death. Uh, I knew my shipmates had all passed away. And I uh, I looked at John Cleary in front of me, and uh, he was encased in ice. His hands were all glassy-looking, and, um, and so he was such a nice kid, just a, just a young man, 20 years old, and his, his life was taken from him. And, you know, with all the praying I did, I, I, I guess maybe I felt like this was the final insult. Why had God forsaken us like that? And I got up on my elbow, and I, I shook my fist at the sky and told God that uh, he could go to hell and the Holy Family. I didn't need him. I can make it on my own. And then I laid down, and then in an act of love and empathy and envy, I, I chipped the ice off his fingers. Off and, of John Cleary's hands. Uh, yeah. And all the while, thinking about what I had said and what I had done, and then I thought, well, maybe I was trying to get God's attention. I don't know. But I, I, I truly felt sorry for what I had said. And I tried to make a joke, a joke out of it. I got back up on my elbow and, and shook my fist at the sky. And I said, and don't send your son. This is a man's job. And I laid back down kind of laughing. And I knew that somewhere in this frozen body, I was still in there. Art, Sto um, Art Stovek had passed at that point. John Cleary had passed. Had Fuzzy died at that point, too? Oh, yeah. All right, so there was. It, you, I want you to tell the story of. I think it was John who passed first. He yeah. was on his side, and you talked about foam. And uh, share with me what that was about. I'm not sure I understood what that was about when you talked about the foam. Well, um, it was about four o'clock that first afternoon, and um, uh, when it, when I, I happened to look at John, and um, John was wearing the sweatshirt and jeans. Art yeah. was in pajamas, right? Yeah. All right. I looked at John, and there was like a white foam coming out of his mouth. That was This was the first morning. Right. And I looked at John, and there was a white foam coming out of his mouth. And I jabbed him. I said, John, I said, you okay, bud? And he didn't respond. Well, I jabbed him several times, and he didn't respond. Uh, Art Stojak was behind me. I took my elbow, and I jabbed him. And I said, Art, are you okay? And uh, the same situation. He, he had passed away. And... Um, Charles Washburner was curled up behind my legs, and I kicked him. I said, Fuzzy, I said, you hanging in there? He said, oh, yeah, he says, I'm still hanging in there. Oh, boy. And we talked briefly, but uh, oh, not, nothing much was said. And uh, just, you know, what our chances are, how things happen, what time, you know, the ship went down and all that stuff. And then uh, I went back to praying, as I'm sure. I asked him if he had been praying, he said, yeah. And uh, then about 2 o'clock that afternoon... Did Fuzzy did Fuzzy give you any instructions for his family? I know that No. Okay. So the only one that had really given you any instructions was John Cleary. or was it Art? John Cleary. John Cleary. Yeah. And um So it was two o'clock. Yeah. And well two o'clock uh, I felt Fuzzy moving around. He put one hand on my hip and the other on the deck of the raft and boosted himself up and was looking around. I was faced out to sea, I couldn't see anything. And he said, I can see land. He says, uh I said, how close are we? He said, we're quite a, quite a distance away, he said, but we seem to be drifting in that direction, you know. And he laid back down, and we talked a little bit about being home for Christmas and our families and, you know, how nice it would be to be in a nice, warm hospital uh, with nurses waiting on us and everything. And, uh, and then we both grew silent again. This was on the morning of November 29th? Yeah. All right, so you had been, and what, in the water maybe eight to nine, ten hours? Yeah, something like that. All right. Could you yeah. see the land? Did you turn around to see the no, land? No, I couldn't see the land from where I was laying down. All right. And then um, about 4 o'clock that afternoon, he did the same thing again and looked around. He said, well, he says, we're, we're really close to land. He says, it won't be long before this raft will be hitting the bottom of the lake on the beach. And he didn't sound right, you know. And um, I said, are you okay? And he says, you know, he says, it, it feels like my lungs are filling up or something. I said, well, can't you cough it out? And he started coughing, and he died. And uh, he, he, when he died, he fell with his arm around me. And uh, then for the next 24 hours, that was 14 hours after the, the ship went down, and for the next 24 hours, I was alone. 
And, you know, for a long time, uh, well, if you, I, 10 years ago, I couldn't have told you about that because I just, although I didn't kill him, I kind of felt like the instrument of his death by telling him to cough. But, you know, going to psychologists and doctors, they said, well, you know, he was already dead. His lungs were freezing. You went through uh, a night by yourself. You'd already been through one night. Yeah. You had awakened in the morning, and uh, you still had one companion with you. By that evening, Fuzzy had gone. Yeah. yeah. All right. Now, you still yeah. had you had some flares. Did you take inventory of the flares you had left? How many flares did you have left at, at this point? At that point, I had four left. All right. Yeah. When did you decide to fire off flares? A little bit later that evening, after it got dark, I saw some lights coming from on shore. And I didn't know if it was somebody, I didn't, you know, I didn't know if I was in farm country and somebody was out milking or if it was a house or what, you know. So I loaded the flare gun and uh, I fired it off. And uh, this time uh, when I fired it, uh, it broke right where the where breaches were. The, oh, no. Yeah. So, but what I did when it, when it fell, it hit me in the head and I picked it up and it was hot. And I rubbed it with my hands and rubbed my hands all over my face, trying to keep keep it warm a little bit. Oh, what a great idea. Yeah, and then I, I thought, well, maybe I can still get this to, well, I started yelling, you know. How far away could you, from the lights, could you estimate, or you a quarter mile, a half mile, what, how far do you think you were? Oh, um, probably, probably less than a half mile, probably a little bit more than a quarter mile. All right, and you're snatching every bit of heat from the oh, barrel yeah. after you fire these sulfur flares. Yeah. And then I figured, well, I don't know, uh, maybe if I, I load the barrel and hold it together, maybe I can make it fire. And so I fired off another one, the second one. And again, I yelled and screamed. And all I was looking for was just a flashlight coming through the woods, but, you know, nobody came. So nobody. You, f- you fired two, and that means you had two flares left. Yeah. Now, you started to have some what I would call near-death experiences or, or after-life experiences And you were seeing people, and you were seeing things. When we come back, we've only got about a half hour left. We're going to talk about your your near-death experiences, who you were, uh, who had joined you, uh, the visits that you had from shipmates, and then we'll get to the the punchline just as quick as we can. You're listening to the story of Dennis Hale, the sole survivor of the Daniel J. Morrell. It went down November 29th, or November 28th, November 29th, 1966. And you're listening to 93 WIBC. 93 WIBC. My name's Denny Smith, along with Dennis Hale, the sole survivor of a shipwreck of the Daniel J. Morrell. It took place in November of 1966. Uh, Dennis is joining us here this, e- this evening. Dennis, before we get to your uh, near-death experiences, I-, I want you to help our listeners understand the bitterness of the cold. You had been at sea in in tremendous wind, uh, your shipmates who had passed away had already found themselves encrusted in ice. What were the temperatures like on the life raft at that time? Uh, they were 30, 30, 33, 34 degrees. Um, and you have a difficulty moving because all the blood comes from your extremities and goes to your core to, quite, to try and keep your vital organs warm. Did they ever tell you how close to death you came? Um, no, but I know how close I came. My, you know, my, when they picked me up, my body temperature was 94 degrees. But I was conscious, cognizant, and communicating with anybody that would talk to me. I can't remember my old Boy Scout training. Doesn't your heart stop beating at 94 degrees? Yeah. So you, oh my goodness. All right, now tell me about the uh, the near-death experiences. You had several of these, and I'm not going to spoil them all, but I the all one right. that touched me the most was the one with your shipmates. Can you share that one with us? Yeah, well, um... I, I kind of have to start from the beginning. beginning there, you know, right. have you, I, mean, I know everybody's been in a in a place where, like, they've been in the mall and they can feel like somebody watching watching them. Right. Well, I was eating ice off my collar with my pea coat, and I had this feeling. And I looked; there was a man there, a very strange looking guy. His hair was white, uh, wavy, almost to the point of being curly. Uh, he had real bushy eyebrows. His complexion was uh, like skim milk used to be, white with kind of a blue tinge to it, and he had a very neatly trimmed mustache. And his eyes were very deep set and forceful, or, uh, and I'm not sure how he communicated with me. But he told me not to eat the ice off my coat, and I, I laid down. I got off my elbow and laid down. You were you were very very thirsty at this point. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I had a rope that I was sucking water off from the flare gun, but somehow that that became misplaced or lost. Oh, that's what you called the lanyard. Now I know what yeah. it was. Okay, yeah. I was reading about the lanyard, and I was trying to remember what you had that for. Okay, I got it. And um, as soon as I lay back down, I found myself above the raft looking down on it. 
and uh, there were dark clouds all all around me, like black clouds. And uh, the focal focal point was the raft and the bodies of my shipmates and my own body on it. And then I started spinning around real slow and being sucked backwards very slowly. And uh, the further I got away from the raft and everything, the the faster my my speed seemed to increase. And I can remember at one point uh, turning around and looking in the direction I was being pulled. And uh, by this time, the clouds were all very very bright white. And uh, as I turned around, there was a a bright light at the end of this uh, tunnel of clouds. Uh, And all my my whole demeanor changed. I I wasn't uh, concerned about uh, dying. I wasn't concerned about living. I I felt very happy and very relieved. uh, And I felt very loved. And uh, when I got to the end of this cloud, I, I took one step backwards and turned around, and I was in a very, very uh, green field uh, with uh, flowers, colors like I've never seen before. And there was a man there that called me over to him, and he, he took my hands, and uh, my whole life seemed to pass before me in my hands. And uh, then he told me I could cross over this footbridge where family members were waiting. My mother, who I had never met, was over there. And... Uh, my main concern was with my shipmates. And uh, I asked about them. They said they were at the bottom of the hill we were on. And I went down there, and the morale was there. And uh, um, I'm not sure how I was moving. I, I, I just don't know. And I went aboard the morale, and all my shipmates were there. And it was it was just beautiful. Everybody was hugging and laughing, and, and some were crying with joy. And it... Uh, it was just a very beautiful thing. And then somebody said, let's go to the back of the boat and into the engine room where the rest of the crew should have been. And we did, and it was the same thing back there. And uh, everybody was just so happy to see each other. Like I say, they were laughing, crying, hugging. And um, there was an engineer uh, coming down off of a ladder, and he looked at me and he said, Dennis, he says, uh, what are you doing here? Uh, it's not your time. You have to go back. And just briefly, uh, I saw the eyes of my shipmates, and they were all very sad. And with that, I was pulled out of the engine room, back through the cloud, and back on the raft. And uh, once again, thirst hit me. I didn't question any of this for some reason. I don't know why. Thirst hit me, and I uh, I called out to the man again. I, I called him Doc. I guess I felt like somehow he had ministered to me. Doc was the man that pointed the finger at you and told you not to eat the ice off your pea coat. That was this time that he did that. He didn't okay. do that the first time. Okay. But he pointed his finger at me, and, and he shook it, and he says, I told you not to eat the ice off your collar. You're going to lower your body temperature, and you're going to die. Well, I laid back down and uh, prayed and waited and waited, and I heard this noise, and I looked up, and it was a helicopter, and I waved to him, and I saw the helicopter land uh, on the beach in the water. And two of the Coast Guardsmen got out and walked over towards me and picked me up. I was laying on my right side, or my left side, and laid me on top of one of the bodies. And uh, I started talking to them, and uh, they were quite surprised that I was alive. Oh, they thought you were dead. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, Dennis. And um, uh, they asked me if I had any injuries, and I told them I thought I had a couple broken ribs, and I knew I didn't. There was uh, those steel pipes I was laying on, and one, on, one in my armpit and one, one just above my knee. And my hips were down in this hole. So they picked me up and they, they carried me over the helicopter and loaded me onto the helicopter. Dennis, how big of a man are you? How tall are you? At that time, I was, I was uh, about six foot one and uh, I weighed about 250, but you know, most of my life I lifted weights and I was, in, I was in pretty decent shape. On the phone with me is Dennis Hale. You have uh, heard the harrowing experience. He had been at sea. Uh, on the Daniel J. Morrell that went down on the morning, about 2 o'clock in the morning on November 29th. We are now on November 30th, and he has been discovered uh, by a helicopter. Um, what happened after you got on the helicopter? Well, I, I saw as soon as they lifted off, I saw a thermos on a bulkhead, and I asked them for something to drink, and they said they couldn't give me anything until they got me to the hospital. No way. Yeah. What? And, oh, th- they were afraid you'd heave? Well, uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. You know, uh, exposure. Yeah. And they got me, uh, t- they took me to Harbor Beach, and I landed on one of the docks, and they loaded me onto a, onto an, into an ambulance, and they took me to the hospital. Um, I talked to doctors, I told them my injuries, they asked me about the broken ribs, and I explained that to them. And while they were, uh, I had a gash under my chin they were stitching up, and um, 
uh, my legs were pretty well numb, mid, all the way up to mid-thigh, and they, they were wrapping my legs, and I saw the sheriff, um, a guy by the name of Bob Swackhammer. And I called him over, and I asked him to call my wife, and I gave him my phone number. And he took about three or four steps away, and I called him back, and I gave him my area code. Um, all the time <laughs> having conversation with everybody. Oh, my everybody. gosh. Yeah. And uh, I talked to the doctor. Well, there was uh, Dr. Oaks Sr. and Dr. Oaks Jr. took care of me. Yeah, let me read this report to you real quick. All right. He was admitted to the hospital in Michigan at 4 p.m. on November 30th with cold exposure and rectal body temperature of 94.6 degrees. His extremities and body were cold, blotchy, and purple, but there was no actual frozen tissue. The patient was warmed up to 97.4 degrees in 90 minutes and in five hours had a rebound temperature of 101. Now, you talked about watching yourself sweat. Can you share that with us? That was the most amazing description I had ever heard in my life. It was amazing for me. My my left foot, uh, I would get a cramp in the arch. And the only thing that would seem to relieve that was if I, I pulled it up in towards my groin. And, um, of course, the first time I did it, my feet were sweaty, and I took the sheet and I wiped it off. And then I happened to notice as I looked down, I could see it sweating again. I could see it making the sweat and the sweat running down my foot. Now, before we go to the next break, I want you to tell the story. The priest comes in, and something very strange the priest gave you last rites after you'd been saved. Yeah. Um, how did that affect you, Dennis? Well, um, you know, I was blue when they brought me in there. And uh, although I made it, I knew I wasn't going to die. But there's always that possibility that I could have had a heart attack through the night or a stroke or something, you know. So I, I, he came in and gave me the last rites. Of course, I had to have confession. And after it was all over, I laid there and thought about it for a while, and I, I called him back, and uh, I had confession for a second time. And uh, uh, I had I had confession three times that night. Wow. I figured if I was going to go, I went around and make sure I all right, got rid of all that heavy junk I was holding on to. Yeah, Dennis uh, Hale joins me. When we come back, we're going to tell you how you can find this book. Because there's only one way to find this book. I got it from a friend, Dennis, and we're going to tell people how to get it. But we're going to sort of wrap up this story because it is just so amazing. Folks, you've only heard 5% of the story. The other 95% is up to you to sort of dig out. And when we come back, we'll finish our conversation with the sole survivor of the Daniel J. Morrell. My name's Denny Smith, along with Dennis Hale on 93 WIBC. Well, my thanks to uh, Lori Simmons, her husband Robert, for sending me this book. The name of the book is Shipwrecked. It's written by Dennis Hale. Dennis, uh, before we get too far along in this final segment, how do folks get a hold of this book? What's the best way to get the book? Um, well, you can reach me online at uh, Dennis Hale uh, at Windstream, two words, dot net. All right, Dennis, or, D-E-N-N-I-S-H-A-L-E, at yeah. Windstream, all, but it's all slammed together there, yeah, Windstream dot net. Yeah. All right, and or, so... Uh, or you can mail a check. The book is nineteen ninety five plus four dollars right. shipping and handling. All right. If you want to send a check for twenty three ninety five to Dennis Hale, um, P O Box one oh four, Rock Creek, Ohio. All right. Four four and folks, uh, if you have trouble remembering this, uh, just drop me an email. I will uh, certainly get it to you. You know my email, Denny at WIBC.com. And by all means, uh, let me know how you want me to sign the book, to whom I personalize it and sign it. Ah, oh, Dennis, what a cool guy. And hey, now listen, you've been on the Oprah Show, the Today Show, the History and Discovery Channels. You've got a big event coming. They're going back out to the shipwreck site, are they not? Yes. And we're, we're supposed to, I'm supposed to go out there with the History Channel next summer. And they're going to be diving uh, and trying to get into my room and see if they can find any of my belongings there. This was 45 years ago, Dennis. Yeah. Well, you know, I had one of these little Crocs with a rubber seal on the top that I kept my jewelry and change in. Yeah? If they could find that, that'd be great. Um, tell me about, you were hungry. And uh, when you uh, finally got a chance to get something to eat, what was the first thing you were able to eat or drink? Well, you know, I had a terrible craving for consomme, something I, I really didn't care for. Consomme? You like, mean like a bullion? Yeah, like a beef bullion. Yeah? And they, they, they did, eventually did bring me some beef bullion, and I couldn't swallow it. Was I mean, it because you were craving salt? I have no idea. Just that I wanted that, and I wanted orange juice. And uh, I couldn't, it was like I forgot how to swallow. I just, I couldn't swallow it. How long were you at sea in these temperatures? On the water? On the water. 38 hours. 
38 hours. Yeah. The university, did, the university of Victoria did a study on hypothermia, or hypothermia. Right. And they claim a person dressed as I was under those conditions could survive for 2.44 hours. I was out there 38. Do you think it was your body mass? Are you a big guy? Were you heavy? Were you? F- I was in good shape. You know, I, I lifted a lot of weights most of my life, uh, and I was, I was in pretty good shape. But I think, um, you know, in reading my book, you've learned that I lived a life of survival. Yes, you did. And that book's name is Shipwrecked. We're talking to Dennis Hale, who was the only survivor of 29 shipmates that went into the water that night, uh, November 29th, 1966. Dennis Hale was the only survivor of the wreck of the of the Daniel J. Morrell. Um, so, uh, what's God got? What's God got it uh, in store for you? You know, what uh, what's the plan for Dennis? Well, right now I'm waiting to hear from Ron Howard. I've also got a lady writing a screenplay uh, in Chicago. Uh, I do an awful lot of public speaking. I haven't got a free weekend until December. How did I get you, man? Was that just dumb luck that I got that you here just, for? T- that was just dumb luck, really. I was really- on the road an awful lot. You had some wounds. Um, I didn't realize that until I got farther into the book. When did you get the? You got some uh, uh, busted in the chin, and uh, where else did you? Where else were you hurt? Was it your hands? Well, I, my, I had some skin pulled off a couple of fingers, and. Um, the frostbite. I had one frostbite blister on my left foot that had broken, but no gangrene. Um, my injuries were were nothing. Where did you get the? Where did you get busted in the chin? What happened with that? Do you know? Uh, it must have been when I was thrown overboard. I must have hit something, and 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 you know. How bad of a gash was it? How many stitches did you take? Uh, I think it took four stitches. Four stitches. But then you know, I've had uh, eleven surgeries on my left foot. I've lost my little toe on the side of my foot. And uh, just recently, uh, this past year, I've had uh, half of another toe taken off. And I've got a, a prosthesis in the great toe. And then on my right foot, uh, I've had one surgery on three toes. Uh, it, does it all go back to the time of being yeah. so cold there yeah. for all those hours? Oh, yeah. 38 hours total. And 38 you're, total. And you're supposed to be able to make it 2.4. Yep. Well, if you think about it with your shipmates, uh, that may have been just about right. Now, yeah. did they did they figure in your size and your weight and um, uh, your layers? Well, I, you know, at that time I weighed about two fifty, but you know, I only had a thirty two inch waist, thirty four inch waist. Wow! So, you, I mean, I was in good shape. Well, Dennis Hale, uh, one more time, tell us how uh, folks can find this book. Um, you can write me uh, with a check for twenty three ninety five at Dennis Hale, uh, P O Box one o four, Rock Creek, two words, Ohio. Four four zero eight four, or contact me online at uh, Dennis Hale at windstream dot net. Um, before I let you go, when did you get first get to see your wife? How long did it take her to get to you? Um, I think it was the second day. They flew. They flew her up. <laughs> what was the first thing she said to you? Do you remember? She's just crying. Yeah, I bet she yeah, was. She's just crying. Were you crying? I don't think so. I don't think I had any tears left. Yeah. I did all my crying on the raft. I guess so. Well, Dennis Hale, um, I send you all my best. Uh, Thank you for being so gracious. Uh, Folks, you only heard 5% of the story, the story of his youth, and you were an ornery kid. I will give you credit for that, Dennis. I was, I was. Have you been good ever since? Uh, Well, it depends on when you're talking. (laughs) (laughs) You keep an eye open for me because I do a lot of traveling talking. I'll be in uh, St. Louis and I'll be in Chicago. If you get to Indianapolis, you've got to call us here at 93WIBC. You've got our phone numbers. You track us down. But we certainly send you all of our best. Good luck on this uh, this film quest that you're going to have next summer. We'll keep an eye out on it. You say it's on the History or the Discovery Channel? It's going to be on the History Channel. On the History Channel. We'll keep it. Well, Dennis Hale, thank you so much. Uh, I have been honored to uh, to speak with you here this evening. Folks, there you ha- have it. Uh, 29 guys go into the sea, and one man survives. You never know what God's got in store for you. It may be sorrow and tragedy, and you may be angry, but you keep swinging. That's the story of a survivor. Again, the name of the book is Shipwrecked. You can find him at Dennis Hale, all together, D-E-N-N-I-S-H-A-L-E, uh, at windstream.net. My thanks to Lori Simmons for <laughs> sending this off to me. My name's Denny Smith, right here on 93 WIBC.